Awesome. What a great place to be on a Sunday morning. Let me tell you something. We finished up a series. It took us 10 weeks to do it. We finished up a series on spiritual things in church. We talked about the manifestation of spiritual gifts, and we kind of talked about a little bit more to go along with that. It's important that we follow what the Word of God teaches when it comes to what we do here. And I was really praying about where we go next and what happens next and should we do a series, should we not? You know, all these things coming up, you got some holidays coming up here a little bit, planning. So, um, I was looking through my notes in my phone. Uh, how many of you take notes on notepad in your phone? Sometimes it's the greatest thing for me. Because I don't have anything to write with. So I've got all these notes, and I was looking through some of them just to clean house, and I came up with one from a year ago. I'm not sure exactly what the occasion was that I was taking notes. If I figure it out, I'll give credit to whom credit is due. But somebody said, we are more equipped for visitation than habitation. And I wish I could remember who said it, but I got thinking about that and I thought, you know what? I think that's true. Visitation versus habitation. We is the church. We are more equipped for visitation than habitation. Sometimes people get real defensive when you start pointing inward. And they'll say things like, well, I have Jesus in my heart. Or, <coughs> or things like, my faith is very private and personal to me. Or when they feel like they're being provoked to a little bit deeper relationship with God, maybe they'll say, well, I don't really need the church. I have Jesus. None of those statements are biblical, just so you're aware. Um, in our day of uh, a life on social media versus a life in real time, let me give you a little bit word of comfort. People in general are nicer than the people you see posting on social media. The, the world is not quite as miserable of a place as X or, or Facebook or any of those make it out to be. There are some people that you think they never leave their house, they sit around and complain about everything. And you get into that last one, I don't need the church, I, I've been disappointed with the church. Well, join the club. We've all been disappointed. Not with Jesus, but with church people. But guess what? You're a church people too. And you've disappointed some people. I've disappointed some people. But church is what Jesus died so that there could be this living, breathing organism called the church. We need each other. Lone Ranger Christianity is not a thing. Can you be saved and go to heaven? Well, okay, sure. Is that all you're in this for? Is to go to heaven? What about what the, the task that God has given to all of us? The Great Commission. Go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples. Go, therefore, and preach the gospel. So we've got to do it together. Visitation. I'm not talking about people visiting us. I'm talking about God. We're more open to a visitation from God than we are a habitation. There again, if that troubles you, you may be thinking, well, of course God is welcome in our church. Or you may say, well, God's everywhere, all the time. Or you may even say, he can come in and do his thing anytime he wants to. Again, not biblical statements. God is there wanting to be pursued. We, get, we can get passive aggressive toward God. Like, I'm not going to tell him anything that's bothering me, but it's up to him to come. 
How about coming before him? Make your habitation among us. Difference between a family coming for a visit and having them move in with you, right? (laughs) Some of you said amen. (laughs) Doesn't take much to plan for a visit. Takes a little bit more to plan for a habitation. Coming for a visit, what do we do? And we all have that room. We all have that drawer. Maybe a couple drawers. Just shove everything in there. Put it in the spare room, close the door. And we vacuum and we light some candles. <laughs> I'm not speaking for anybody else, I understand. I'm just speaking for us. Doesn't take much to prepare for a visitation, but you know what? A visit has a, a, an intended end, right? I think I love Jeff's comment he said one time. It's time to go, time to leave. He'd say, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. (laughs) I think he learned that in Tennessee. But what about habitation? Are we as a body of Christ, are we as equipped for a habitation of the presence of God as we can be? The visitations are the ones that make memories. I had a special experience with God. I had a a moment that I can remember when he was so real to me. The worship today was so incredible. God spoke to me. These are all wonderful things to experience. But these are visitations. If we don't move on from visitation and establish a, it's actually creating a culture that welcomes habitation of the Holy Spirit. If we try to just live on the memories, that's not a good thing. Memory is a good thing in our experience with God because it teaches us God's character and nature. And it teaches us what we can expect, maybe not to the letter, maybe not to expect God to move in the same way every time, but we can expect that God will visit us that there will be those times in our life that stand out from the rest. But moving from visitation to habitation, and I I want to talk today that we are, we've got to be ready for more than a visitation, that there is more than a visitation. There are times when God moves sovereignly, where uh, I'm sure you've experienced this if you spend any time in church. It just seems like there are moments that you come into this building And you're not necessarily feeling the most spiritual you've ever felt. Right? Right? Maybe you just have one of those days. Maybe you don't feel well. Uh, Maybe somebody let you down. Maybe you just can't seem to connect. And in those moments, so many times, God sovereignly moves. You weren't necessarily looking for it. But God, in his sovereignty, moved in your life. And I'm thankful for those times. I've learned to depend upon that. I have times where I come in here on a Sunday morning and I'll say to myself, I'm just empty. I'm not antagonistic toward anything or anybody. I just feel empty. I don't feel anything. And those are the days that God comes through. Those are the days that he, he brings things out that I hadn't planned on. Those are the days when the, the worship just builds to a, a crescendo in here. And I've kind of learned to anticipate times where I feel empty and I go, good, that's good. Because sometimes we think we have to have everything planned just right. And everything just has to click just right or else somehow God's not going to come into our presence. And that's not the case at all. We learn to depend less on our feelings, less on our emotions, and more on His sovereignty. Let me tell you something. There's never a time that God does not want to respond. There's never a time that God says, yeah, okay, uh, I don't think I'm going to go to church today. You know, where two or three are gathered in my name, he wants to have fellowship with us. The primary reason that God sent his son was so that we could have restored fellowship. He desires fellowship, not just a visit, but he wants to have a habitation in our midst in this local church. And we have special times, you know, where it seems like God shows off. (laughs) It's 
special times of prayer, maybe on a first Sunday night. And we go on the road and go praying for people, and, and there's just a, an attitude of worship. There are times, special prayer meetings, that we come together and it just seems like, wow, God is so powerful there. Or maybe spontaneous times of praying one for another. I see that you do that. I have the best seat in the house. Every so often, someone will just walk over and feel the need to go and pray for somebody. Those are really <coughs> cool times. Times of worship that are off the charts. And if you try to figure out what it was, you can't. It's just that I think when more of God's people are coming into agreement about worshiping God, there seems to be uh, some steroids that are injected into our time of public worship. It could be special days, baptisms. Last week, we had three water baptisms. Man, it was so exciting, right? We were just clapping and we were rejoicing with people that they were making their public declaration that they had decided to follow Jesus. Amen. There are times when we have healing. We have people, we pray for them, and, and they're healed. People that are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit baptism, and we celebrate these things. New members, baby dedications, all of these things in the life of the church. Special meetings. We have an evangelist coming the first weekend in December. Bob Fisher, he's been here before. And those special meetings, they're exciting because we hear from someone whose voice you don't recognize. <laughs> you hear a point of view from somebody on the outside. That's why we need the office of the evangelist, right? It has to be from the outside to be effective. And we have those times, and they're memories, and they're times of visitation. But if we're not building upon those and building a habitation <coughs> for God, I think we're missing out on what he has for us. You know, the funny thing about memories Memories are selective. That's why when we get talking about the way things used to be, we forget all the bad stuff and only talk about the good stuff because a lot of times we're not happy with the way things are going now. So we, we go back to a memory and we think of the good stuff and we say, if they only did now what they did then, everything would be perfect. And there may be an element of truth to going back to some mindsets. I won't argue with that. But as a general rule, you, if you're looking back to the memories of the past, you'll never go forward. Amen. It could be that God wants to use you as an agent of change. When you see something that does not honor God, if all you do is think about the way it used to be, how can God use you to change something, right? Memory can keep us from going forward. Memories can keep us from remind, reminding ourselves that the Great Commission is still in effect. So, if we're going to have more than just memories, we need to create an atmosphere, a habitation for God in our midst. I want to look at some scripture this morning. Uh, this will be on the screen. Some of the other scriptures will not be on the screen, but uh, I'd encourage you to follow as you can. This is the NIV this morning, Matthew 17. One to five. Uh, this is a uh, familiar uh, passage of scripture to many of us. Jesus had just got done telling his disciples that some of you will not taste death before you witness the kingdom of heaven. And I personally think that he was talking about this event. I may be wrong, different commentators feel different things, but just the way that it starts after six days, well, after. It's placing us at where? After six days from what? And if you read back to the end of chapter 16, you'll find out that it was the discussion about seeing the kingdom of heaven. So anyway, that's the setup. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And I love it. Verse 5 says, while he was still speaking, just, just imagine that he just kept going. And then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to build this, and then we can do, can't you hear him going on? Have you ever done that? And God shuts you down. 
While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. You know, far too many genuine moves of God, far too many revivals have been ruined with a building. That starts out in revival and ends up uh, being turning into debt and emptiness. The time to build buildings. We need a building for our use. But I think that's the natural default of human beings. When, when there's a mighty move of God, we seek to build something to remind us of that move of God. And sometimes I believe the building is premature. Because then we stop forgetting, or that we stop forgetting. That's not what I meant. Then we stop remembering. <laughs> I'm almost 61, okay? Then we stop remembering what God did, and we start worshiping what we built to remind ourselves of what God did. And if you don't believe that, I encourage you to go to any church building that's been around for <coughs> 50 years or more, or maybe even 46 or more, and try to change something about the building. We need more than visitation. We need more than memory. We need a habitation of God. Jesus offered Peter, James, and John an insight to a reality that they had never seen before. And there was a purpose for him taking these select three, Peter, James, and John. There was something special about them. And when I get to heaven someday, I'm going to ask God, what was special about James? Because we know very little about him. He was the first one martyred of the disciples. But Peter, James, and John, there was something special about them that Jesus wanted to make sure that they had a glimpse into this, this, this glorification uh, of Jesus would be uh, eventually in his glorified state. These three men were able to get a glimpse of what that was going to look like. And they saw Moses and they saw Elijah. How did they know they were Moses and Elijah? I don't know, but apparently they did. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, and Jesus there as the fulfillment of both. And, and Peter did what Peter does, Peter does, or Peter did, or whatever I'm trying to say. He did what we'd expect him to do. He just started talking. Right? And what did the voice from heaven say? Shut up. Listen to my son. Stop going on at the mouth, as my dad would always say. Hey, stop going on at the mouth. Peter went on at the mouth. But we got to cut him a little slack, don't we? Because you've done the same thing, and so have I. Where we have felt the need to react to a visitation and think that we had to have everything figured out, put it in the right category, and let's build a building to preserve it, and let's figure out what our doctrine is on this. And blah, 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 blah. And God says, just shut up and let me teach you something. Build a habitation for me where you don't have to have all the answers every time something happens. But you know when you've built a habitation that eventually you will understand. We're not living on the sparks. But we're living on the, the warmth of the fire right. that goes on long after Sparks have stopped. A habitation. Peter reacted to this visitation and he, he missed the greater point. And here was the greater point. That because of Jesus' soon death and resurrection, and because of what was soon to come at Pentecost, and because of this corporate entity of the church that was about to be birthed and come onto the scene, that visitation would give way to habitation. Jesus disappointed them many times, I'm sure, when he said, I'm going away.
but it's for your good. They couldn't see it because they were used to a visitation. They were about to experience habitation that the Holy Spirit would come and indwell each believer. That after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit could come and overflow each believer in Jesus Christ. That we could live far above our pay grade. That we could walk in, in faith and confidence in God like no one had ever had before. Not even the prophets of old. Not even weird people like Elijah huh? and Elisha. That this would be a resident, a habitation of the Holy Spirit in each individual believer's life. But listen, what about corporately? What about the church? What about our attitude toward habitation? Equipping for habitation requires more than preparing for visitation. I've, come, I've been up myself. I've come in here on Sunday mornings and I say, could this be the day that everything breaks loose? Could this be the day that, that people would just be so hungry for God that they just couldn't accept anything but all you have for them. Could this be the day that, that the place fills up? Could this be the day that we see, you know, miraculous healings, and spirit baptisms, and all of these kind of things? And, and I have to confess, there are times that maybe I seek more for that visitation. Who doesn't like a visitation? Who doesn't get blessed, right, when, when God breaks through all of our mundaneness, is that a word? Yes. And wakes us up and proves himself to be mighty in our midst. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe and I am convinced that God intends for habitation so that visitation isn't, re isn't restricted to every so often, but all the time. That we are designed as children of God and as a local church to fully expect to walk into a habitation for the Holy Spirit of God that we just expect all of this stuff all of the time. And when we get our minds changed about that, when we agree to expand our thinking as to what God wants to accomplish, that it just be a natural thing. You walk in here expecting to see God. You walk in here with a burden in your heart. I can't wait to praise Him. You walk in here with the attitude of, of I'm going to experience the God of the universe today, then you are building a habitation for God. And then you don't worry about how you feel walking in. You worry about what you know. I know I'm going to meet God. I know he's going to make himself real in this place. I know that he's going to change me so that I can go out there and fulfill what he asked us all to do 2,000 years ago. Some people would say, you're programming God. You're telling God what to do. No, not at all. I'm expecting God. I'm expecting God. I'm expecting the presence of God to be consistently among us. And I'm telling you today that it is absolutely backed up by Scripture. If I was to pick all of the Scripture verses that prove this, we would be here a long, long time. But let me mention a few. Let's look at the Old Testament. Psalm 115, 12. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. Well, I don't know if there's anybody here that's part of the house of Israel, the house of Aaron, but I'd say probably not. Probably made up of Gentiles, right? But let me show you something. I do not believe that the church replaced Israel. There's a, a theology that believes that replacement theology. No, not at all. But I will say that Israel has expanded to welcome us, to welcome the Gentiles. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Ephesus. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole building is joined together. Building, that is a figurative sense here, right? We worry about physical buildings. He's talking about the building. What is that? It's the body of Christ. It's the church working and knitted together. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. 
we know that the Holy Spirit lives by His Spirit. God's Spirit lives in each believer. But this is speaking of something more. This is speaking of all of believers together, that there's another presence of God that can be expected when we as believers in Christ come together and prepare for a habitation of God among us. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That, that speaks to a constancy. That speaks to an every day. That, that's not just uh, an experience once in a while that we can form into memories and build memorials to. This speaks to a God who every day, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Matthew 28, 20, the very end of the Great Commission, teaching Jesus' words, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Bible says when two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus said, there am I in the midst. Two or three, it speaks to more than one. That's the important thing. Each one of us individually, filled with the Holy Spirit, endowed uh, with gifts from the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. But when two or three come, there's an extra presence. Yes. There's an extra presence that is intended to come. And I got to say, in too many cases, I don't think here, by and large, but in too many cases, there's too much of a consumer attitude that follows people as they walk in the doors. Yep. There's a very passive way. Because why wouldn't you be passive? You're sitting there listening to some guy ramble on. And you're sitting in these nice orange padded pews. <laughs> and you're looking this way. It, 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 it shows kind of a passivity. And that's okay. There's times to just simply receive, right? But if, if your whole experience with the body of Christ is sitting in an orange padded pew looking this way, we're missing out of what God has intended for all of us. Right? So we come together realizing that in us we, we are, we're, we're saved, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you are, and we come together and there's a habitation that we build that says the presence of God is in this place. Yeah. Why? Because we're in a building with pews and a steeple? No. It's because this building is feed, filled with people who are seeking to be equipped for habitation. Amen. John 15, 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. Jesus' words. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's fully God's intention that we stay as close to him as we possibly can. It is fully God's intention that he, he, he intends to show up in a powerful and a real way when we come together in the name of Jesus. We can fully expect that. We are presuming nothing. We are presuming nothing to expect that the Holy Spirit of the living God will be in our midst in a powerful way. We don't tell Him what to do. We're not going to try to program Him to fit our order of worship and all our stuff. You know, it's like, oh, aren't we great? Look at this. We've got videos and we've got a sound system. We've got lights and we've got streaming and and all of that, and then try to make God just fit into that. No, not at all. But we can fully expect that He is going to be God in our midst. But it takes some equipping. It takes some preparation. It takes more energy than a visitation. But it has long-lasting benefits. As we walk in this confidence that when we come into a place that's equipped for habitation that we're going to experience him we anticipate his habitation all the time not just in those encounter moments i love that god does things like that i, I love that there are times that it's just so real and i felt it this morning even before we got started that, that just something i just sensed something incredible was going to happen today and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the times where I feel depleted and I feel empty and then God comes in and just does what he's going to do. And I love those kind of times. But if we approach them with an emotional mindset, 
what follows is there's going to be times we're disappointed. If we approach it with an attitude of confidence that God, because we have prepared a habitation for him, that God is going to be God. God is going to move. He's going to do these things. We know he is. But our emotions are not so dependent upon it that when he doesn't do the little sparks and and the encounters, we're still confident. So we maintain a confidence that no matter what we're going through, hey, lousy things happen. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good, right, to them who are called according to them who love the Lord, called according to his purpose. But nowhere does it say that all those things are good. There's some things that are not good. We live in a fallen world, we're going to have to walk through it. But when we are not basing our relationship with God over those special visitations, and we're committed to a habitation, we'll walk right through them. They won't turn us into a basket case. They won't say, I'm never going back to that church. You know that person didn't even say hi to me. And you don't have all that stupid stuff that splits people. I didn't like that song. Well, okay. It wasn't for you. It was for God. And all this stuff just falls by the wayside. I can't believe they're putting chairs in instead of pews. We're not planning on doing that right now, but someday we might. Oh, I can't believe, can't believe they're, they're doing that. Don't they? They took the carpet out of that room over there and put it for, oh. See, when, when, when the building becomes uh, the memory, mm-hmm. and when you stop having experiences with God and all you have is memory, that's when people get upset with stuff like that. Yeah. I made a comment one time. There was a church that Melody and I were part of for a while. She grew up in it. And it was a very old building, beautiful, beautiful building. Um, but boy, oh boy, trying to do something new was tough. <coughs> and I said to her one time, it's nothing a good fire wouldn't fix. <laughs> She said, you better shut up. Because <laughs> this building's going to catch fire and they're going to come looking for you. <laughs> Sometimes a church building needs to close or catch on fire or something. If, if the ministry has stopped, if there's no desire to equip for habitation, pretty much over. And we have to be careful. We have to be careful. I don't want fire to destroy this building. This building isn't that old. We haven't been in this building. Any of you, even the people that have been here the longest, hasn't been quite that long. Uh, You know, 46 years. Church has been around for 85 years, but not at this location. But give it another 10 or 20 years if Jesus doesn't come take us out of here. And then that kind of stuff will raise its ugly head again. Because if you're hooked to memories, if you're hooked to visitations, and not preparing for habitation, mm-hmm. you'll focus on all the wrong things. But as we <coughs> continue to walk in confidence, we anticipate more than just a momentary experience. We uh, become ready to trust God in the ordinary and not just the extraordinary. Even the days that you walk out of here and say, I didn't quite follow that sermon. It might be today. But you walk out of here and you say, boy, the worship team really wasn't quite. I understand that you have all kinds of people for lunch on Sunday. But maybe there's that day where all the bells and whistles didn't go off and and everything didn't just work right. You can still walk out of here going, we were in his presence. Because we have equipped ourselves for a habitation and not just a visitation. How do we do it? There are practical ways to do this, to equip ourselves for habitation. And and the one thing is this, allow him access to all of our rooms, not just one. And even if we're talking about a physical building, haven't you seen that sometime in church? Everybody knows you don't do this in the sanctuary. Everybody knows you do do this in the sanctuary. As if you can't do or not do that anywhere else. This is the place that we set apart to worship God. 
but he owns everything, right? right? Yeah. We want him to inhabit every part of what it is we do here, whether it's in the building or just within the building that's made up by fellow believers. That means that we have the same reverence for God in the fellowship hall as we do here. It doesn't mean that we make up stuff. Okay, it might be a good idea to not run loops around here unless it's in the spirit, right? It might be a good idea to tell the kids, now take it easy, don't jump around in the pews. It might be a good idea, but it has more to do with taking care of what God has given us than it does doctrine. Like it's okay to destroy things out there? No. It's not. Give him all the rooms. And that applies to our lives as well. If we're going to have habitation between us as believers, we have to have given him the right to do that in us. And that means open every door. He already knows what's in there. You might as well just tell him. Honor all our decisions. Honor God in all our decisions, not just the overtly spiritual ones. There are parts of a church parts of church life that maybe we kind of just do, we don't really have to pray over it. God's given us the talents and abilities and giftings, and we just simply operate in those. Whether it's administration, whether it's scheduling things, maybe it's even cleaning the building, whether it's uh, the mechanics of who's going to be in the lobby on Sunday morning to welcome people, or when do the doors get locked, and all that kind of stuff. We've got to give Him honor in all of those decisions. Everything we do should honor God. Everything. That's, that goes individually first and corporately as a church if we're seeking to equip our place here for habitation. Make prayer the norm, not the exception. How many of you heard other people say, well, all we can do is pray. After we've tried everything, I've tried everything I know how to do. But I guess all we can do now is pray, as if, as if, well, all hope is gone, but we can do this. Prayer has to be the first thing. Before we make any decisions, before we decide what to do and not, what not to do, it has to be bathed in prayer. Every meeting should be a prayer meeting. Whether that's a meeting here, or a board meeting, or a trustees meeting, which we need to schedule, by the way, or an events team meeting, or any of that stuff. Make prayer the norm, not the exception. Our planning, our administration, our finances, the way we function in the community has to reflect more than just an occasional visitation. It has to reflect that we are seeking a habitation of God in everything that we do. Whatever preparation is necessary to equip the local church for habitation is worth whatever price has to be paid. Got some sacred cows, butcher them. Got some priorities that need to be modified. Maybe we've always done it. It's not a good enough reason to keep doing it. Maybe we've never done it. It's not a good reason to keep not doing it. Refocus vision, and we've got to do that from time to time. Who is God bringing to us? Who is God taking us to? That means that the vision has to be fluid. The mission is always the same, to make disciples and lead people to Jesus. The vision has to be fluid for what God is using us in and wants to reuse us in. Apply the Word of God as the ultimate litmus test. If it doesn't pass that test, it doesn't happen. Stop looking at what other churches are doing doesn't mean we're not concerned with other churches. It doesn't mean we don't do ministry with other churches. God continues to bless us, I think, in one part because we are willing to work with other churches. But let's not copy them. He made us to be us. He made them to be them. We don't need to copy fads. Fads are fleeting. They don't last. If you've been around on earth long enough, you've been in ministry long enough, you know that's true. The fads don't last. Determined to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. 
That means a yes. Sarah, it's almost like you read my notes when you got up this morning. I know you didn't. Um, <laughs> so it's almost like the Holy Spirit wants us to understand something, huh? Whatever the cost. If you put a cap on it, consider removing it. If there's a limit to what you'll say yes to for God, consider removing that limit. If, if myself or one of the staff or someone a head department had asked you to do something, well, maybe, okay, maybe it's not for you, maybe it is for you, but if God is asking you <coughs> to do something and He is in it, Amen. remove that cap. Amen. For some of you, it's coming into a room and just letting loose and worship. For some of you, it is being willing to pray for someone wherever they're at, whatever they're going through. For some, it might be giving. It might be finances. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to trust God in this, that if I give him a tenth that he's going to provide, but I just can't. i got a cap there. Yeah, I love God and I trust God, but I'm just not sure. Maybe it's stepping into an area of service that you've never done before, but you feel God leading you. Say yes. He'll equip you. It's usually with on-the-job training. Right. That means you're going to mess up. And that's okay. Failure is not the end of the world. It's necessary. All of this begins in the heart of the individual and spreads to the corporate body called the church. To be equipped to be a church that invites the habitation of Jesus and not just a visitation requires some things. And these three things I'm going to mention to you today, in addition to... Uh, realizing that there's more than visitation. That's today's title, right? There's three more things that I'd like to look into. And as far as I know, they will be three weeks to come. Uh, I imagine we could go on, but as it is right now, I think four weeks maybe ought to cover it. Here's, here's where, three other things in addition to what we're talking about today that I believe that a church has to do to be equipped for habitation. Uh, hosting his presence. That's an intentional desire and expectation that we know God is going to be here. If we were hosting a guest speaker or a, a visitor or even hosting Harvest Hosts RV guests back here like Barb and Terry do, there are certain things that we do to put out the welcome mat. And I believe the same is true in a spiritual sense of how we become equipped. Uh, the second thing is building a culture of honor that we honor God. That goes to what we say, what we do, what we plan, what we spend money on, all of those things. Building a culture of honor. And then thirdly, relying on what He knows, not what we know. And that can be some of the hardest things to do. Because we all have certain things we're good at. And it's, it's not bragging to say we know that. Right? There are certain things we know we're good at. And if we're not careful, we can rely on what we know we're good at instead of relying on what God knows. But I think overall, we, we want to equip this local church for a habitation that there's, there's never a thought that we have to come in and somehow beg God to be here. We know He is. We know He is. And it increases the, the, the anticipation with which we come into His presence. That affects us when we're away from here and when we're here. Starts in each individual, right? First thing you got to do, if you've never made a commitment to Jesus, that starts first, salvation. Yes. It's only through Jesus. Jesus is the only man who ever lived that lived a perfect life, but yet paid, and yet uh, did not sin, but yet paid sin's penalty of death. He's the only man that ever walked the face of the earth that did that and then defeated death by rising again. The only man that ever walked the earth that did those two things and then ascended to his Father where he lives today. He is the only hope, our only way. And um, until you come to a point where you stop trying to make things happen on your own and you say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I am going against you. I want to live for you. Change me. Forgive me into the 
for, of the sins change me into the kind of person that can live for you. That's first. That moment of salvation. You can't do any of this other stuff until you take care of that. The other thing is approaching the subject of revival. Allowing, if you're a born-again believer, allowing for the truth and the fact that you can always be revived. There's always room to be set on fire. There's always room to remember what got you excited about Jesus in the first place. Only men and women and boys and girls can stop revival. I, I get a little weary of people crying out for revival. Lord, send revival. And I think he's like, well, just go ahead and do it. Do it. Do it. Get revived. You think I'm going to stop you? Be open to revival. Let God take you from one level of enthusiasm, I guess we could say for him, to the next. We all need to be revived. Consecration. Consecration. That's a churchy word, but it means I am giving you everything. I give you my life. I, I want you to spend me as if I was a coin in your hand. I want you to do with me what you want. I am sold out for Jesus. And then come to him and say, I want to be filled with your spirit. I want everything you have for me. And believing that the same God who graciously saves you upon your request will graciously fill you upon your request. Stop looking for the emotion. Know that he has done it and walk in it and you'll start to see all this stuff changing. Huh? Sometimes we pray for people to be saved and they have an emotional reaction or they fall to the ground and, and those times are wonderful. Uh, it, it makes for good testimony, right? Sometimes we have people up and we pray for them to be healed and instantly they feel it or we've even, we've even been cases where a limb would grow out or something like that or an organ would, would grow in. I mean, those things are incredible and they encourage us. These are great testimonies. But it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes it's over time. And someone will go, oh, wait a minute. I'm healed. Spirit baptism is the same way. Sometimes people immediately, the tears come and the hands go up and they immediately start speaking in a heavenly language. And we see the outward and we say, oh, isn't that exciting? But it doesn't always happen that way. And what we have to remember is when we ask Jesus to save us, we have to walk like we're saved, even though we don't necessarily feel different. When we ask Jesus to fill us with the Spirit, we have to walk expecting that we are going to have power for service. That is the, the, the primary reason that God sent His Holy Spirit, that we would be equipped to do what He asked us to do. And we walk, and God begins to reveal Himself. So don't get upset if you don't see the visitations. <laughs> Understand that we're walking in habitation, the presence of God. It flows over into our corporate life as a church. We commit to worship and pray and learn and serve together. All in. It's heartbreaking to try to disciple somebody or try to lead somebody to Jesus who is all excited one day and the next day they give up. <coughs> and from this side of things, as someone who's followed Jesus for a long time, I say, what in the world are you hanging on to that is so much better? Yeah. And it's heartbreaking. You know what I mean? You talk to people like that, and then you say, they're just not ready to give up. They're not ready to give in. They're not ready to, and that, why? What is so good about what you're living now that you can't let it go for what God wants for you? As we grow in Christ, there's going to be different levels of that. I see that person over there. I, I see how they are just sold out for Jesus. And, and I could be, but I'm not quite ready. Why not? I know we have learning and prayer opportunities that go on here in the life of the church. And I know that go to that, but I, I just don't do that. Why not? I hear people talk about how they read the Bible through multiple times and they really know Scripture. And that's just not me. Why not? Yeah, come on. What are you waiting for? What are we waiting for? We're going to equip this church as a habitation, a place where God dwells. And God proves himself to us. And God grows us. And 
enriches us. We're going to have to come to grips with this. Treat every service, every meeting, every event, every Bible study, every prayer meeting, even every work day as an opportunity to be in his presence. Everything. We do it as unto the Lord. We treat it as another opportunity to host the habitation of God. We expect to be people of the presence. I would love to walk downtown here and people say, oh, I know who they are. They, they carry the presence of God. There's something different about this person, man. When they come in a room, somebody comes in with them. Can I suggest to you that that is not meant to be the exception, but the rule? People of his presence. People and a church that is equipped for the habitation of God. Expect his presence to be in us, among us, around us, for us, behind us. (laughs) To live in freedom from and freedom to. Freedom from the guilt of my past. Freedom from my genealogy. Freedom from what my father and grandfather and great-grandfather were. Freedom from my sinful nature. And freedom to live for Jesus. Freedom to worship Jesus with abandon. Freedom to dig in to his word. Freedom to expect the gifts of the Holy Spirit to operate in my life. Freedom to become a mature disciple of Jesus Christ. That's freedom. Freedom to pray with anticipation. Folks, I've said this before, and you're going to hear from me again. When we come together to pray, I'm so glad this is a church of prayer. I'm so glad that we have times that we set aside for prayer. Can we please learn, and I say this with all the love in my heart, can we please learn to leave the notebooks at home? Just come in and pray. Can we please take some time to fellowship, but then can we come before the throne of God with boldness and just pray? And if you feel like you want to go pray for somebody or someone says, I need a touch, we go pray for them. Can we stop writing everything down? Can we just come and pray? That anticipation, I can't wait to get here together because when we pray together, things are going to happen. Huh? I know it takes a while to get it, but if you'll trust me in this, this is, a, this is a super key to a church being equipped for habitation, where we stop trying to explain everything in our terms, because that's what we're doing. When we talk about everything and too much, we're, we're, we're coming to, we're, we're explaining things the way we see it, we, we should be more concerned with how God sees it. And when we come before him and we just give him honor and praise. And and we say, Lord, I bring this need to you and I thank you that it's being met. Man, that takes you up a couple notches. You start to live in expectancy. You start to see the miraculous happen. You start to see people really equipped to come before God. To walk in faith as people of his presence. I'm going to keep walking no matter what comes my way. I'm not going to look to the left or the right. I'm not going to let this stuff get me down. got to trust God. Walk as people of the presence. God always goes with you to carry that presence into the world, a world that is increasingly hostile to not as much things of God, but religious things. And I can't really disagree with them. I'm tired of religious things too. I'm tired of stuff that is lip service. I'm tired of just all the rules and regulations that people make up that have no foundation scripture. I'm tired of all this. I just want, I want people to see Jesus. Amen. And the folks, the young kids that are up on campus that are increasingly coming to Jesus, they're coming to Jesus without all that garbage. Yes. They're finding Jesus and they're free. Yes. Represent Jesus. If someone asks you, are you a Christian? The last thing you should say is, Well, yeah, I go to the First Assembly of God. 
Say, yes, I am. I'm born again. Can I tell you what that's about? Sometimes we like to remove ourselves from it and try to just apply a corporate label to something. I don't mind if you tell them where you go to church, but the initial response should be, yes, let me tell you how you can meet Jesus. Can you learn to, to walk in trust in God that he's going to give you the words to say in those situations? And to show, by example, what it means to be spirit-filled disciples of Jesus.